Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Anne Orloff and I am a proud Wolverine and have had the great pleasure of working for the University of Michigan in the Northeast for the Office of University Development for the past 13 years. Today is a wonderful combined edition of Michigan in Manhattan, as well as the Boston Speaker Series. The lineup is just too good to be true. And so we wanted to join our New York and Boston alumni and friends together. So thanks for being here. Before we get started, just a quick note, as I'm sure there will be lots of questions, feel free to enter those questions into the Q&A window throughout the program and we'll do our very best to get to them. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Jennifer Friedland. Jennifer spent nearly 20 years working for social justice organizations and it became quite clear that so many of the moving tales of struggle and perseverance and hope were underrepresented on the stage. So she founded Clear Day Productions to uh, invest in so many productions that could amplify those historically marginalized voices. Since 2018, she has invested in multiple Broadway and off-Broadway shows and is a graduate of the Commercial Theater Institute's 14-week program. Jennifer has a BA in history as well as a JD from the University of Michigan and is originally from Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. She now lives in New York City with her husband, Rick, also a Michigan alum, and her two children. Thanks for being here, Jennifer. I'll pass it over to you. Good afternoon, and thank you, Anne, for the introduction. I'm delighted to come together today to celebrate two of my favorite things, the University of Michigan and live theater. It is so exciting to witness the return of our beloved Broadway, which I think we all believe represents the heart and soul of New York City. Since moving to New York from Michigan almost 20 years ago, I can confidently say that my life has changed as a result of the magic and artistry I have witnessed on stage. To see the theater district full of energy once again, coupled with the industry's renewed commitment to equal representation both on and off the stage, reaffirms my love of theater and support of the arts. I can't wait to hear what our panelists have to say this morning. So I am pleased to introduce Michael McElroy, Chair and Arthur E. and Martha S. Heron, Endowed Professor of Musical Theater. A Tony-nominated musical theater veteran, McElroy joined SMTD earlier this month after 10 years at NYU. McElroy is also a Grammy-nominated vocal arranger, composer, and a leader in forging diversity initiatives for the performing arts. In 1994, he founded Broadway Inspirational Voices, a diverse professional choir of Broadway artists united to change lives through the power of music and service, for which he served as musical director until coming to Michigan. In 2019, Broadway Inspirational Voices received the Tony Award honor for excellence in the theater. We are thrilled that he has come to Michigan. Michael McElroy, welcome. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Jennifer said, I have just begun my tenure as chair of the Department of Musical Theater here at University of Michigan. It is an incredible legacy to be a part of, one that was started by Brent Wagner and propelled forward by Vince Cardinal. But long before my relationship with the University of Michigan began, I was and continue to be an actor an artist who was blessed or lucky enough to have a career on Broadway for over 30 years. My first Broadway show was Miss Saigon in 1991. And my last Broadway show was the revival of Sunny in the Park with George in 2017. Whether performing, teaching, or leading a department, I look at what I do as service. Service to the characters I play or stories I tell, service to the students that I teach, and service to the communities I am blessed to be a part of. So in March of 2020, as our world shut down and our streets erupted in protest, our industry went dark and silent. This has never happened before for any extended period of time. We have a famous saying in the business, one that is embedded in all of our DNA, and that is the show must go on. But for the first time, we could not. And from the silence of these dark theaters, there arose voices. And those voices spoke about the disparities within our industry. 
We could not go about our lives running to auditions or doing our eight show weeks, so we had no other choice but to listen, face our issues, acknowledge the systems that have caused harm, and together build a better community. And now, as we witnessed at the Tony Awards this past weekend, Broadway is back. But how did we get here? As we continue to navigate a pandemic, our industry has been working to make changes both big and small. And today we have assembled a wonderful panel of artists to talk about Broadway's journey to reopening. All of our panelists are alums from U of M's Department of Musical Theater. One of our panelists I performed in a show with and in multiple workshops. One I've sung with and worked for his company. One panelist and I hail from the same hometown, and two of our panelists I've performed on Broadway in the same show. These folks are not just talented at what they do, but they are deeply empathetic individuals who care about our industry and making the world a better place through our art. So without further ado, let's introduce our alums. A star of Broadway stage and musicals and plays and screen, we have actress Jenny Barber. Hi. Hi, Jenny. Uh, another, she's from Ohio as well as I'm from Ohio, and we have another Ohio native, don't hold us against, against us, please. Uh, Tony Award winning actor and musician, Gavin Creel. Hi, everyone. Hi, Gavin. Hi, Michael. Hi, Jenny. Uh, Broadway actor and founder of the Broadway Collective, Robert Hartwell. Tony nominated Broadway actor and screen actor, Ashley Park. Co-founder of the Uraka Group, a live entertainment merchandising and producing entity, Matthew Riga. Hi everyone, nice to see you all. Nice Welcome you. everybody. Nice group. Let me start by saying a couple of discoveries I've made since coming to the University of Michigan. Alums from the School of Music, Theater and Dance and specifically the Department of Musical Theater are everywhere in our industry. From composing to producing, acting, directing, choreography, marketing, casting, you name it. And there's an alum doing it at the highest level of ex excellence within our theater industry. And because of that, we can bring these special kind of insider events with our alums who literally are everywhere within the theater community. So many of you have submitted questions. I may not get to all of them, but I'm gonna try and take us through this journey from shutdown to Broadway's return. Also, as, uh, uh, as was said, please feel free to place questions in the chat and we'll try to address those as well. So my first question to our lovely distinguished panel, I wanna start by opening up the floor to all of you with this question. Were any of you stay, uh, in a project, a show in the beginning stages and workshop or whatever, or anything like that when our industry shut down? And can you talk about that experience? Ashley? Um, funnily enough, because Gavin's on this, <laughs> um, I was just about to, I had just, um, I think I was in a play called Grand Horizons, um, that second stage theater had produced and we had just had our closing night on Broadway. So I believe we are one of the last shows that actually got to close um, before the pandemic hit. And then I was supposed to go right into rehearsals for Thoroughly Modern Millie at Encores. Um, so, and that I think we figured out pretty early on after the pandemic started that that was probably something that that was not gonna be able to happen. We didn't know how long pandemic was gonna be, but so that was, I think I had had one music rehearsal with Rob um, over at um, at the New York City Center to kind of run through music and see if I could do it. <laughs> but, um, and it was a it was a huge bummer. It was a part that would, uh, meant a lot to me when I was in high school. Robert was one of my directors when I was in high school, um, and I had a lot of U of M grads as my directors when I was um, at Pioneer High School in Ann Arbor, and. Um, so yeah, but I also felt like early on, I I, I don't know, like I I I was I was super bummed about it, but I also felt like there was just so much going on and everybody had lost something, so I didn't feel a big sense of personal loss. Um, I kind of accepted it kind of early on. So yeah, that's what I was up to. 
Thanks for that. Anybody else? Um, I was doing Waitress in London on the West End, and we were actually only, we only had one more week to go. We had extended for two extra weeks. I was over there with Sarah Burrell, it's the writer and star of the show. And um, it was bizarre, Michael and everyone, because I, as we all remember, this thing that none of us had definition for was happening, but it didn't have, it didn't have specifics. And, and you were like, what? And we were doing the stage door every night. And I remember sitting, having dinner with Sarah after a show and I was like, I don't know if we should do the stage door anymore. Should we be like shaking all these hands and giving all these hugs and stuff? And we didn't know what it was. And, and she was like, I want to respect whatever decision you make, but these people came to, this is part of our job. And we were like, yeah, I was like, right. It's important to, to find a way to give. I'm going to tell you something now. I am going to be wrapped in saran wrap if I ever do a stage door again. I'm going to have gloves, a mask, a saran, body condom. I'm going to be wrapped in every kind of latex. And I'm going to be like, hey, you want to meet me? I'm just going to bump up against you. <laughs> it's real. It's real. Yeah, it was, it was an interesting time. I was in rehearsal for the uh, AIDA revival. It was the 20 year anniversary and we were three days into workshop and had a whole trajectory from that rehearsal through going on tour, then going to Germany, going to London, coming to Broadway. And now it's all been pushed back by two years. So yeah, it was, we were literally in rehearsal and rehearsals were shut down. Um, so here's another question. When the industry actually shut down, as we were watching these protests around the world, many voices began to speak up about issues in our theater community. Can any of you speak to that moment and how the industry navigated that time. Did you learn something new? Was it were, were these surprises? What? How did you receive and process what was happening as voices started to come up in our community around what had been happening in our industry for a long period of time? Anybody? Well, it's a, it's a huge question. Oh, sorry, Jim. You go. You go. No, it's 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 a. First, it's great to see you, Michael. So let me just say that. And I'm so glad you're in this job because uh, you're amazing. So let me just say that, first of all. Um, it's, such a, it's such a tough question because it, it, was, it was and continues to be so complicated and complex. Um, you know, we were all, I think, faced with um, the immediate. Can you hear that drilling behind me? I'm going, to, I'm going to let Jenny go because someone's doing literally drilling it. Okay, I think they stopped. Um, sorry, uh, but there was like such a, a a tension, I think, between the response to the pandemic, which you saw people who were either going into go mode and do 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 and trying to skip. Okay, I'm going to skip this, Jenny. You got to go. It's too loud here. <laughs> okay, I'll take over from Matt. Um, our time we spent together in quarantine, which was no I'm kidding. Um, Hi, um, you know, I think those, I just remember the, the first two months of being in um, the, you know, just being inside my apartment with my almost three-year-old and my husband and just thinking what, like, where are we go? Like, where, where can we go? What are we doing? And then there was so much reflection. There was so much time to be introspective because we couldn't leave. We couldn't go down the street essentially. And I think we were realizing, and not that we weren't realizing what was happening, but that we realized that we had to do something now. This was the opportunity for change because this is the window. And if we don't take this time now, we may never be able to recapture this collective um, uh, anger and 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 rage and to, to funnel it into a creative and actual like practical um, decisions and change that we can make. So I think that it just felt like, okay, this is the window, this is the portal. How do we go through it mindfully and compassionately in the best way possible? Yeah. And because no one could go anywhere, it was, the, it was the perfect opportunity to listen, right? And to hear it and receive yeah. it in a way that wasn't defensive or, right? But just to hear it and, and take it in. And then we could start to, just by having that kind of grace to hear the stories, then to allow ourselves to be open and vulnerable to say, okay, how do we make it better? And that's one of the things I have to say for our theater community that I've seen in this time is we have always have been a, a supportive community and support each other. But when this was exposed, all the things that were going on, there was a sense of from the majority of our community, let's work together to, to make it better. Um, I, don't, I don't, can I just add one thing to that, Michael? Yes. Which 
I don't think the listening and grace was immediate. No. To be honest, yes. right? I actually think there was a lot of defensiveness and I think there were a lot of people who were uncomfortable and there was a lot of um, a lot of demands being put on everybody to discover that ability to listen, to discover that ability to be graceful. And it took it, it, it took basically, I think a lot of people to understand, oh, this is a lifetime process, right? We are not embarking on something that we are going to oh, fix today or tomorrow. And so that's what I was trying to say before the drilling in New York City started to happen was um, that immediately after the pandemic, there was such a moment, in, at least amongst producers and general managers of wanting to do, 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 because that's what everyone does. They were scheduling and rescheduling and we had one show that had done nine previews on Broadway that was stopped. We had another show that was nine weeks before first rehearsal at the Goodman Theater out of town. And these things halted and everyone on the producing and management side was like, let's get to work again. And the artists, I think, thankfully, were like, huh, maybe we should reflect. Maybe we should breathe. Maybe we should listen. And here's why. And the the that that reckoning has continues like i don't think i could go through half a day without and i'm not saying one day but i need half a day without people talking about well what does it mean in this moment to um to be anti-racist what does it mean in this moment to create a, a community and you and i have talked about this ourselves of calling out and calling in and the grace that you possess so wonderfully, I think it's just something that is, uh, like I said, it's, it's a lifelong process that we all have to strive for. And I think also just to add on that a little bit, thank you for that, Matthew and Michael. Um, as for me, my personal experience was that as the industry and, and people and other actors and, you know, all parts of the industry really started to speak up about um, you know this maybe the systemic parts of this world that we love so much and this like heartfelt industry and storytelling universe that we just all like we we all do musical theater because we love song and dance and stories and people you know and i think for me my personal experience was that i realized that this experience that i was having and i was so okay um with standing alone at certain points, like I wasn't alone. I had no idea that other people had felt and been through similar things that I did. Um, you know, and I come into an industry that I knew stepping into it, I had to be completely okay with if I wanted to be joyful. The fact that it was run and written for and created by and created for white people. Um, and I didn't, I, I think the reason that I was able to really be in this industry in a happy way before was because I knew those were the conditions and I signed up for it. Um, and what was mind blowing for me as all of these conversations happened at a much, um, a very poignant and huge level in terms of the world and our country was I didn't even realize that these were things that could be broken down and changed. So I had to sit personally and be like, how was I complicit in this staying the way that it was? Because I understood the rules and I and I wanted just to be a part of it. So I allowed it to keep going. And then how much am I willing to step up and also talk about that? And what was interesting in Matthew you used talking about the um it didn't or people were very active right away or not active, you know. Um I think everyone had their own journey really, but for me, I found it difficult at first when people were suddenly willing to listen, you know, because I, I got into a place where I, my coping mechanism and my survival mechanisms were so that I didn't, I, I put that all away. And so to be asked, can you, um, can you relive your trauma just for us to understand? Like, I had to be like, can I just like, have a beat, <laughs> like be like, oh, what was that? And it, what it felt like in terms of the injury was kind of that moment, like when you become an adult and you're like, oh wait, my parents are humans. Wait, did they not know what they were doing when they told me to do that? Like what, you know? So it felt like that as like a whole, we were like, oh, this like industry that we're like the, the game players and the rules, like, oh my gosh, we, 
we are maybe able to be like, wait, let me teach you something about, let me teach you mom and dad that maybe that thing that you taught us or that way that you raised us is not a good thing, you know, so. Yeah, that's that's really, thank you for sharing that. It's, it's you know, during this time, you know, what I have to, once again, I love our industry. And, you know, yes, there was that paralysis at, initially, but then people have really, stepped up, up and tried to make a difference. Um, and now we have to hold ourselves accountable to that. And we've had other organizations that have been formed in this time. And I just want to name a few of those. Uh, Black Theater United, Broadway Theater Coalition, Broadway for Racial Justice, Musicians United for Social Equity, um, Broadway Advocacy Group um, Coalition, who uh, received the special Tony honor on Sunday for their work. Um, and so there's been a lot of changes that have been happening. You know, we have shows now that have chief diversity officers. There is this um, more EDIAB training that is, that's happening across our theater industry. Um, I'm a member of BTU and we have a new deal that we put out uh, that was, we brought together all people from all areas of our industry uh, to, to, to create. Um, so there really is change and now it's about how can we sustain it moving forward and so we can grow deep roots so that we can really make that change uh, keep keep happening moving forward. Michael, um, can yeah. you Michael, can I ask a question of you? Because you were part of the New Deal, would you mind just sharing with everybody like just a couple of the points that you guys that everyone that was involved with it came up with? Just just to, just quickly, because I think it was so empower it was so powerful. Um, we worked with Kenji Yoshimi uh, from uh, NY, NYU Law, uh, and he was our facilitator. And we brought together theater owners, theater producers, creatives. So one group, group was like uh, directors, choreographers, uh, musical directors, uh, costume designers, set designers. And one room was composers, lyricists, uh, playwrights, um, orchestrators, and then you, a union room. And a couple of things that we came up with, one was uh, mandatory EDIAB training in some form, that that's just the ground level, that we're starting to really uh, socialize, that we are um, a diverse group, and these are some of the issues that we need to look at when we're starting a new show and ongoing in shows. Another was no more all white creative teams. Um, which seems like a no-brainer, but really bringing diversity to how we put together a team. And, the, and one of the other ones, last ones, was um, no unpaid internships. By having internships that are unpaid, it, it, it creates a world where only people who have privilege and have fin the financial means can take those interns, internships. So those were a couple of things that we worked on. And it's a, it's a living, breathing document that we will continue to work with. Um, Robert, I want to just skip to you for a second. Um, we're talking about the, the, the theater community as it is now, but you're working with the theater community that is to come, right? Mm -hmm. The Broadway Collective, your company, uh, which was just ranked uh, in Inc. Um, 5000 is one of the fastest growing private companies in America. <laughs> um, the work you do, just I want, you, I want you to just tell us a little bit about your company, but then also, has it changed? because of what the last 18 months has revealed to you? Um, first, it's so good to see you, Michael, and such an honor to be here with all of you. And I wanna start by saying, I think what's so special about Michigan is that I do believe they teach us how to be listeners. Um, you know, I'm thinking back to early on in the pandemic, Rachel Hoffman, who is a graduate of the program and a casting director in New York City and has given so many Michigan grads their first jobs. She was one of the first people that actually reached out to me and said, I have some questions. I and just really, we just had a really beautiful conversation and something that I, you know, come back to day in and day out is that I believe the change in this industry begins at the educational level, because if you cannot see it, then you cannot be it. And so being at Michigan from 05 to 09, I had one teacher of color, you know, um, and he was a trailblazer in his time in the 50s and 60s, you know, at the Metropolitan Opera. But now to be able to, for these students, and I would say Michigan is one of the most diverse musical theater departments in the country, to have a Black man at the helm of this program 
is so huge um, and it's so monumental for truly the framework of, I think, how all educators begin to move forward because so many times we have seen BIPOC people come in and be the tap teacher, you know, or BIPOC people come in and, you know, choreograph once on this island. Um, but to be able to have someone from our industry who is so respected and who has done everything from Sunday in the Park with George to Miss Saigon to, you know, it, it's just, it's fantastic. And we're just so blessed that you're carrying on this legacy. Um, and I would say it definitely has changed. You know, um, the needs of students are so different. Um, then when I was in school and even we opened this company in 2016 and students just wanted to work hard. They just wanted to like get in and dig in and just, you know, but now students truly have a voice and they demand to be heard and they demand to take up space. And so I think there's a huge level now as educators where we are really having to sit and be still and listen, you know, and and pivot accordingly. So I've definitely seen a huge difference in the classroom as far as the needs of the students and what it is that that they need. And I do have to say, I come back to that moment of sharing and extending grace with Rachel Hoffman in that moment, you know, for both of us to listen. And I, as an educator, have had even as a black man, you know, have truly just had to sit and listen. Um, so I know that was a little around the way, but I just had to say that um, I'm so glad that you are here. Um, it is really, I think it's sending a signal to academia literally across the world, especially just like Ashley said, for an industry where usually everyone at the table is Caucasian. So very, very, very grateful that you're here. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, Gavin Creel. <laughs> okay, so we have history. Uh, we did hair at City Center together in 2000, I want to say. Yeah, yeah. We did one of the first workshops of Spring Awakening. Yeah. By the time it came around, we were too old to play the parts, but that's another story. <laughs> um, you've been a member of my uh, choir, Broadway Instructional Voices, since 2000. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my question to you, you know, we've been friends for a long time, and I want to know how you experience our industry uh, moving forward. Um, you're an artist, but you also, for me, have always been an actor. You know, you're deeply invested in service, giving back, humanitarian efforts. Talk a little bit about what you witnessed or experienced in the industry during that shutdown and how you want to see it or how is it moving forward? Thank you for that question. I also have to just make a slight adjustment to I, my first, I graduated University of Michigan. I came to the city within the first week. I met this man, Michael Goddard, who was a friend of Michael's also. And he was like, hey, what are you doing tonight? And I was like, I don't know, I just moved to New York City from Michigan. I have no idea what I'm doing tonight. And he said, I'm gonna go second act a benefit. And I was like, that's kind of classless, but I'm in because I have no money. So we second acted the Broadway, it was the Broadway gospel course or something at the time. It wasn't, it, you hadn't branded just like this international thing that you are now. And I watched that and I watched on stage and this is part of my activism has been in this, sort of in this area of, I saw this stage full mostly of people of color with the occasional little fleck of salt in that beautiful pepper shaker of life and love and music and power and just sound. If you've never heard the Broadway Inspirational, it's the most amazing thing you've ever heard. But I remember watching and going, I could never be in this choir because I'm gay, because I don't go to church, and because uh, I'm white. And then I did the workshop of Spring Awakening with Michael, and that grace was again afforded to me, somebody who felt outside, and we're like, what am I? And, and this industry is made for a white man. And he was like, would you like to join the choir? And I could not, it was like the greatest gift ever. So I just had to say that. I, I will say, um, when I call an activist, it makes me uncomfortable because I see people who are out there doing the work. It's their life's work and it is not mine. And, and I, I, I think there's a lot of armchair activism that's happening in the world. And, and, and I, I, 
I think there's space and room for anybody who wants to speak up about whatever, in whatever way they want. That's the grace that I have sort of tried to afford everyone during this time, was looking and going, my opinion of how that person is talking isn't really relevant. I am centering my opinion and my feelings rather than listening to the fact that that person, maybe they're, they set their hair on fire and they're running down the street. And I'm like, I don't know that I would have chosen that tactic, but that is their right to, and when I make it about like, well, my defensiveness or my uncomfortableness, I just, I had a friend of mine, a white friend, say the other time, I just think it's amazing what we're doing, but it's all going too fast. Can we just take a beat? And I said, no, that is not an anti-racist mindset. The anti-racist mindset is take a beat to a, 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 a people who have literally only had beats, have literally been told no over and over again, and now I'm uncomfortable. So that's that's where I see it moving forward. I think it's having grace with myself, with my defensiveness and my, oh man, I said that, I shouldn't have said that, or, and going, decentering de myself, getting myself out of the argument and going, I might, like Robert said, it's time to listen. And, I, and I'm excited by Broadway. I, I'm a little nervous about the title of this show, Broadway is Back, because it insinuates the thing we were. Oh, it's here again. I'm not interested in that. Anyone who's watching, anyone who's on this panel, it's not what I want. I want a new Broadway that takes the best parts of it and expunges the worst. And there was a lot of worst. And I'm gonna ask um, Jessica, I think, or someone here that's on, on, our, on the team that isn't being pictured right now. I took an anti-racist course by this amazing woman, Nicole Johnson, who does this training called Edify. I cannot recommend it enough. She is holding space for white people to educate themselves. And one of her people sent out a, uh, a pamphlet, a PDF that I'll pass along and I would love to pass to everybody that is a two-sheeter that is about the history of musical theater. It is built on racism. All of musical theater is built on minstrelsy, blackface, and racism. It doesn't mean that I, as a white person, have to be hurt by that. It's the truth. If we can all, white, black, uh, Asian community, Latinx, um, able-bodied, uh, transgender, all of us accept that we're not trying to run from the truth in the history of our industry. We love musical theater. Ashley's saying that thing about, I just played by the rules. The rules were built on racism. And I, Brent Wagner taught us about this, the black crook and minstrel shows. And, and I just heard it as history. But if we can accept it's our history, acknowledge we can't just going, oh, but it's such a great place. I'll send the PDF, give it a read. That's what I want to go forward to. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. You know, um, I just want to put this out there as well. During, and I'm going to move into where we are now. Um, but the during uh, the shutdown, I have to say, you know, I, having been, I moved to New York in 1990 in the height of the AIDS crisis and watched our community rally to support our fellow community members who were battling and continue to do so today. But I have to say that without the Actors Fund of America and Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS, when I tell you they literally supported our community during the shutdown, paying people's rent, paying for their medical bills, paying for their utilities, paying for their groceries, right? And you know, all they ask of us usually is to you know fundraise twice a year uh, and do a couple shows, give a show, do a ninth show every you know year. Um, but without them, I don't know where we would have, be, would have been. And I also want to name some of the angels that I heard about. I heard about a producer who literally reached out to anyone who had ever done a show of hers and gave them $2,000. Just said, if you've ever done a show of mine, here's $2,000 to get you. Because at that time, we didn't know how long it was going to be. But so there were angels and people who were really trying to support folks as we were trying to figure out how long this was going to last. So I just want to make sure we name that into... Uh, to uh, really talk about the, the, the angels and people who are supporting us. Well, Ash, about, oh, sorry, oh, you're about to ask me a question, but just really quickly on the Actors Fund, just like the, uh, I was just going to say that I saw, I saw very much firsthand. And of course, you know, we've done these galas, we do these things, and I had never really seen stuff personally. Um, I had, I had re recently left a show called Mean Girls, and um, a lot of the cast in that show were, um, 
you know, single like peers of mine, like at a certain age group and to have a lot of them not be able to get unemployment from like the, the government and the country and be like very dependent on this actors fund that we would do this like ninth show of the week for. Um, there is one cast member who I've become very close to who had just been diagnosed with another tumor like right before. And if it had not been for the actors fund and to go through all of that stuff when like you don't even have the joy of like even knowing that your show is going to come back and Mean Girls did not come back, you know, um, and to not really understand like it was very tricky with the unemployment and all that stuff so it was in the health insurance you know like at a certain point we all there was like the, a d-day that we all kind of knew like everybody who's working in live theater here comes the day now everyone's out of health insurance so like it was just like what broadway cares did an actor's fund and like as many like virtual kind of things that they tried to do like it really it really i saw firsthand for the first time really how where those funds went yeah that's, yeah, it's true. You know, we do these events that we don't even know. We just do them because that's who we are and it's tradition in our, in our, in our industry. But to be able to see firsthand, this is why it matters, was really something that we learned during the shutdown. Um, uh, I want to just, get, Matthew, I'm going to ask you a question. As a producing entity, what changes has your company made as a result of what we learned during the shutdown? How are you moving forward? Well, I... What's, but it was great hearing Gavin talk about, to me, was just moving forward in a new way, right? And, and I think, I don't know any producer who is approaching uh, new material or new projects in the old way. Like, and if they are, they're not working with us, that's for sure, because I don't, I don't, you know, but I think, um, it, and I think it's, it's, it certainly has to do with how we approach, you know, like, and, and, and I don't want to rank any of these things being more important than the other, right? But these are just things that, we, that, that are certainly happening, right? But like, for example, as we're putting together new teams, like we're doing a reading of a new play, right? And uh, we're doing this in, a, in, a, in November. And I, and I would venture to say a couple of years ago when we would do something like this, we would call the, the same people we would always call. We would hire the same stage manager we would always hire. We would just do that because we know someone. We, they're trusted, they're experienced. It's easy, it makes us all comfortable. And you would just go, and you know, uh, you, you can't do that. We, at least we're not doing that anymore, right? Like we're looking at this and, and looking at whether it's the, the, the we see you demands or the new deal or whatever, and we're taking I think we're trying to certainly take real stock of how we create teams of people, people who are in positions of power, you know, and say, how do we bring in as diverse of uh, perspectives as we possibly can? So to me, the, that just the fact that it's even a question, that it's, that it's even something that we're talking about is a huge shift because it certainly was not something that we talked about in this way that specifically, right? So that to me is like, just how we're creating teams is just, a, is a brand new way. I think we're also, uh, you know, what's happening in every Broadway show that I, that I know of, you mentioned hiring EDI, uh, you know, officers or uh, HR companies, right? I think one of the huge things that's happening across all of Broadway and I'm touring as well is that, you know, when people, when, when an artist, whether it was a, a, a musician or an actor or whomever would have a problem in, in, in days past, they'd go talk to the stage manager or the company manager. And not that those aren't great people to talk to, but they're not trained in dealing with, you know, issues of ranging from, you know, trauma to uh, uh, what, whatever it might be, right? That they're just not even prepared for that. And so I think the industry is now saying, oh God, that's something that's of importance. That is something that we have to prioritize is not just um, getting back to work, right? So this Broadway's back. I think a lot of people like Gavin, yes, there are people who said Broadway's back is like your, your fearfulness is not unfounded. But I do think there's a lot of people who are saying like opportunity is back to work. It's, it's an opportunity for people to, to get back and actually do what we love to do no one's going to do it the old way. We're all doing it a new way. 
and we're figuring that new way out. And so I, I'm actually hopeful about it because I, like I said, whether I'm talking to someone who works at the, the public theater or the Goodman or on commercial uh, Broadway, these conversations are happening every day, all the time. And that in and of itself to me is a, is a major shift, right? So there's the practical things that I mentioned, but it's just the fact that this dialogue is happening every day in every corner of our business. And it's not comfortable every day. It's uncomfortable. It's, it feels tough and challenging, but I think everyone is committed to sitting in that discomfort. And, uh, and I think that's, that's, that's an amazing thing. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, I'm, I'm especially encouraged by that is because you sit in that producing space, right? And for me, it's about not just changing the shows that are getting done or who's in those shows, but who's making the decisions behind closed doors. That's the space that needs to have as much change as possible so that you're asking those questions. Difficult questions is really important. And those are the ways, you know, finding the answers or at least asking the questions and sitting with those questions as we move forward and letting those questions, you know, be a part of your decision making um, is how we start to create uh, an industry that could change. Um, I'm gonna ask Jenny this question, but I want anybody to answer it if you want. Um, as I said, Jenny, you, Ash and I did Sunny in the Park. Mm -hmm. I can find your signatures on that. <laughs> um, you know, we have this role, we have this job to as artists, right? That we get to do this thing, right? Um, but my question for all of you who are artists, who are actors, how is it, do you view what you do differently now as opposed to what 19 months ago? How do you view that you, uh, that you get to do this for a living or that you get to engage it? What's different for you? Yeah. Um, well, frankly, I feel like it's, you know, we did that show together. I got pregnant on that show, which was incredible. Children in art. I mean, it all happened. Yes, Ashley knows. We had a little stowaway in our scene. Um, and it, but being a mother, being a parent artist has shifted my relationship with the industry and with my artistry, you know, years ago. So, and it's interesting. So that last 18 months being a parent artist in lockdown with my three-year-old has also shifted how you know I could work really I mean it was it was a it was nearly impossible you know there were moments where I was in my bathroom in the middle of the night trying to record audiobooks because I had no space for not a child running around asking for multiple snacks all day long um so you know and and that's not unique to me I mean everybody was having that experience um if you're a par a working parent period. Um, and I think within our industry, uh, I, I realized what could I do now? What could I do to, to, uh, you know, I, I understand what it's like to um, have to deal with childcare issues, with healthcare issues, with, you know, health insurance. We're talking about all these things that when my artistry is dependent, you know, my, my, rather my, how my child eats is dependent upon my artistry. It's a, it's a, it's a strange thing, you know, to have a, to have this gift within a market economy, you know, is, is hard. Um, and it's much more difficult for, um, you know, birthing people and women of color. It is disproportionately impossible and in our industry. Um, and, you know, with the schedules of, of an actor, it's, you know, 10 out of 12s, you know, in terms of space in New York City and all these places. Um, you know, when we don't have meaningful childcare resources, it we can't have an anti-racist institution. We can't have gender parity. We can't have re, uh, support for reproductive rights. It just doesn't it doesn't happen. And so, um, you know, I I want to highlight a uh, PAL Parent Advocacy um, Artist Advocacy uh, Leak, which is really trying to do some is working with producers and working with communities um, and uh, unions to try to emphasize that part of anti-racist work and part of um, gender parity is also child care support and elder care support, any kind of caregiver support. Um, so, you know, for me to engage with my art is it, I, I see it through this lens right now. This is where I can, I can be helpful, where I can aid. Um, and, you know, it's made me a better artist to be, to be a, to be a parent. It's made me more empathetic. It's made me more curious. It's made me more compassionate. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm always looking at things from, I think, a caregiver's perspective at this point. 
um so yeah it's it's a it's it's children and art you can't really not have both <laughs> that's amazing wow thank you jenny um we're gonna wrap up soon i just have uh, a couple more questions that i have for everybody uh, but i wanted to just give this one to you fast real fast matthew during the shutdown as theater people do we find a way <laughs> to make art <laughs> you know we will find a way and we and you know many of us made you know you know great friendships with zoom with you know, you know that ring light and you know we were creating art we were doing you know you know shows from home readings all of this stuff that allowed us to keep the business going keep art out there in a time which needed it so much um, and it also expanded our our global reach right because we were creating things that now you didn't have just 1500 to 2000 people seeing it a night but you could have people all over the world seeing it so matthew as a producer what is our future as we go back into live theater is is this live streaming this virtual performance is that going away what do you think is going to be the future of how we engage these two things i don't think anyone really knows because it's so it's so new right and it's such a such a new frontier I think there was certainly previously a, a fear amongst producers and institutions that if you were to stream something or present something on uh, you know k k TV or film or whatever before it closed, before something has had its natural life cycle on, on Broadway, certainly, maybe not after Broadway, but certainly on Broadway or the West End, that there was like, oh, don't do that. You're No one will want to come see it live anymore. No one will want to you know, and I think uh, that myth is being, you know, changed every day because I think people are realizing, oh, actually having uh, exposure to and being able to educate people on what it is you're, you're producing and what it is you're creating is actually helpful. So um, I think that, that tool, certainly in like the regional theaters, I, I certainly think that it's gonna be more part of their uh, existence uh, going forward. And I, I don't think they're going to let that go because they just realize, oh, wow, that's how we get people excited. That's how pe we get people, because you're never going to replicate the live experience. Like, like who is not going to want to come in and pay tons of dollars to see Robert and Gavin and Jenny and Ashley and you perform and sing and give of yourselves? Like, that's never going to go away because, and if anything, we've learned over this last 19 months is, oh my God, get me out of the house get me somewhere, you know, I was at the, the first preview uh, for Wicked when we, when we came back the other night and I was, what I was not expecting was the cathartic, just screams and cheering and yelling. And, you know, when Glenda comes down and she says, it's good to see me, isn't it? Like, I don't think anyone wasn't crying. Right, and that's not a moment you normally cry. Like it's like a, it's just a funny, right? But it was so cathartic. So I like is is the live experience ever going away? No way. But is are we learning how the power of streaming and and and, ex, and exposing our you know look, we have Diana a musical we're one of the producers on has its premiere on Netflix on Friday. So we're gonna find out real quickly is that a good idea or not, right? So for all of you out there, please watch it. But you know, uh, but we'll watch you know. the party. <laughs> yeah, but we'll see. So thank you. And Matthew, don't take yourself out of the performing thing. You did go, you were in the Department of Musical Theater. I just want to remind you of that. Yeah. So can let I me just can yeah, I, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Real yeah. quick, I just wanted just to say about I was talking about, you know, producers and, and helping with childcare. I would say Matthew is the only person to have ever given me a stipend for childcare. And it was so welcome. It was it he's He's one of the good ones in terms of supporting us. Yeah. Thank, you, so thank you for that. Yeah. So I'm going to wrap us up, but I wanted to say a few things. This has been a much needed reawakening in our industry. And I, I feel hopeful that as a community, we will rise to this occasion. Um, we found a way to bring theater to the masses during the shutdown, but we discovered or rediscovered that nothing will ever replace live theater. You know, we hunger for that in the moment connection between actors and audience that only can happen live. Hopefully as we continue to return, we will hope to uh, implement systems to support more diversity across all fields of our industry and strengthen our training to create inclusive spaces where all lived experiences are seen and can thrive. 
there's this assumption out here that bringing more diverse voices to the table takes away from those who have had the privilege of inhabiting that space. And I wanna say, that's not true. Instead of operating from a place of lack, we must simply make the table bigger, right? Having more diversity in the room will create more stories and ways to tell these stories. That is the work of our industry. And more importantly, that is the future of our industry. So I wanna thank all our panelists, Gavin, Jenny, Ashley, Matthew, and Robert. And my last question for you is a two-parter. What's coming up for you work-wise? And name one thing you learned at UMichigan that has stayed with you, especially during this time, or just stayed with you. Jenny, go. Uh, coming up for me is vir lots of virtual workshops, so many, uh, uh, and stuff, stuff that I've actually written, which is kind of amazing, um, uh, which is something I learned in this time that I actually have a voice. Um, and I learned at Michigan, which was embrace your curiosity in, and not be ashamed of it. There, I, I grew up in a small community where curiosity was dangerous. And I think that is something that you have to keep uh, cultivating because curiosity engenders compassion. It just does. And it is paramount for how we're going to rebuild and come back and, and be new, you know, and, and not come back, but come, come, come forward. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Robert. No. Um, the, the, the biggest lesson would definitely be leaning on your community. You know, I, I reach out to people that I went to school with or, you know, alumni met, uh, like alumni from the program constantly to, you know, teach our students. Um, and so honestly, just continuing to ask for help. Um, the biggest creative thing would be starting to film and executive produce, um, my TV show on Discovery Plus of my home renovation, which I'm really pumped about. Um, so yeah, that's what what I'll be up to. And obviously, like um, working with the kids. Ashley. So excited about that. Wait, Jenny, send me your writing. I literally had just said, I was like, I could listen to Jenny talk for hours and yeah, you're writing stuff. Yeah, no, it's literally okay. Anyway, sorry. I'm sorry. What was the question? Um, oh, so, uh, what's what are you working on, or what's coming up for you? And also, name one thing you learned at University of Michigan. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I'm right now. I'm in Vancouver filming a uh, a rated R comedy, um, <laughs> and it's with Lionsgate. It's like Seth Rogen's company, and um, it's fun because it is the first Hollywood film that it's four Asian female leads, and the writers and directors are all female, Asian females. And I've never, ever, ever, ever been in a situation like this ever before. Um, so it's just been really wild. And um, I think that like I really learned and maybe not like at, even during my time at Michigan exactly, but you know, throughout my time, like connecting with different Michigan grads too. I think the common thread is just being like a good person and a good um, collaborator and a good friend to people around you. You know, I just think that that is, um, sustained all of us in such a healthy and beautiful way. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Gavin, what are you working on? And what did you um, want to- I'm doing to do a shameless, a shame, shameless plug. I put it in the thing, if you want to pass it along, Jessica or anybody on the team. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to debut a new piece I'm writing, I've been working on for a while, called uh, Walk On Through at the Metropolitan Museum of Art on October 25th. And uh, there's still some tickets left. We're doing a six and an eight thirty. I got a commission about three years ago, and I had no museum or fine arts experience. And they were like, "When you have an idea, tell us what you wrote." So the show is basically about process and about trying to find an idea and where's my purpose in this museum and where's my purpose in the world as an artist. And it's kind of like my midlife. I'm calling this moment my intermission because I'm 45 years old, and if I'm lucky enough to live 45 more years. I want I know act two is where stuff gets a little interesting and then you hopefully ends happily. Um, but that is my my life's passion. It's the most, it's the hardest work I've ever done. Linda Goodrich, uh, one of our professors is the director of the piece. Um, uh, but I, I also wanna say, one of the things I, I wanna leave everyone on the call and everyone here is a representative of that. And especially now, Michael, you're part of it too, now that you're a, a Wolverine. But the thing I have learned from Michigan, but because of Michigan, and that I have cultivated since I've left, is the importance of alumni engagement back to the university, giving back 
to your time. Your, in Methodist Church, it's prayers, presence, gifts, and service. It's like find at least one of those ways to give back to your university because I had this moment when I turned, I don't know if I was like 40 or 30 or something, but I went, oh, my college was paid for not by some magical money god. It was paid for by the generations of alums and people who gave back after they went. And Michael and I are in talks for a really exciting idea, new idea to engage the alums in a new, interesting way that we are workshopping. We're gonna talk about it in November, but it has to do with service, not with performance and masterclasses. We wanna see if we can engage alums, come back, and let's work at the Covenant House with the musical theater majors. Let's do something with our hands, our bodies, our souls, our money, our time. And then get to know so that then when they leave, Michael said this freshman year, his first freshman class is going to be engaged from a service and they're going to have four years of service. So when they leave, they dump right into the Actors Fund, right into Broadway Cares, right into BIV, right into organizations that I know Matthew's company probably has, uh, I know has been a benefactor and, and um, what's the word, Philanthrop philanthropic arms. That's what I'm excited about. And that's because of Michigan put that in my soul. So. Oh my God, I want to go back to school now. If you're we're, doing it. we're doing it. Actually, I'm going in, no, well, you're going to be filming, but Michael and I are going to talk about it. We're going to come up with something really cool. And Matthew, what, do you, what's, what shows uh, is your company producing that are coming? Uh, well, we have lots of, lots of going things going on, but one thing I'll mention, we have a new musical that's based on the novel, uh, The Outsiders, that's premiering at the Goodman Theater next year. And uh, I'm very excited about that. It's, it's, it's an amazing piece. And um, so that's really cool. Check that out if you're in Chicago next year. And, uh, and I, I think everyone is touching on similar themes about what stayed with us from Michigan, but I think the importance of gratitude is probably the thing that sticks with me the most. It was the, one of the first things that Brent Wagner taught us was the importance of saying thank you and being grateful. And certainly that has evolved and changed as uh, I've evolved and changed, but that idea is uh, certainly stuck with me. Thank you. Um, and so before I go, I, one last thing I want to just say to our U of M family that's out there that's been watching, thank you for spending this hour with us. Support live theater. Be safe, but support this Broadway moving forward. Uh, see the shows in your city. Travel to New York City safely and see a show. If you're here in Ann Arbor, support the musical theater department season. We have Wild Party coming up next week, written by alum Andrew Lippa. Um, and just as the industry needs artists and theater makers, it needs an audience and people who support it. That's how we continue on this road to moving forward. So thank you for spending this out with us. I hope you learned something. I hope you had a good time. Thank you to Gavin, Robert, Ashley, Matthew, and Jenny. Love you all so much. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to, to Jessica. Wow, that was a tremendously reflective and energizing discussion. Uh, my name is Jessica Evans, and like everyone here today, I'm also a proud Wolverine and I'm fortunate to work in the University of Michigan office in Manhattan. Please join me again in thanking each of our amazing panelists, Robert, Jenny, Gavin, Ashley, and Matthew, as well as Michael McElroy, Jennifer Friedland, and the whole team of people working behind the scenes to make this event possible today. Thanks to all of you for joining us, spending this time with us. We were delighted to have you. We would love your feedback. Look for an email with a link to a survey coming soon. Finally, thank you again to all for joining us and go blue.